Gumba Daru, Gumba Nani Gyanindu, which is good day, it is good to see you here in Baragam, which is the Aboriginal language of the community that I grew up on the Darling Downs. I'm Vicki McDonnell, State Librarian and Chief Executive Officer. I begin by acknowledging Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and their continuing connection to land and as custodians of stories for millennia. Here at State Library, we are inspired by this tradition in our work to share and preserve Queensland's memory for future generations. Thank you for joining us for the opening of our latest exhibition. Usually we hold our launches in our busy, vibrant library on the banks of the Brisbane River. But today, we invite you to enjoy an online exhibition, 20, Two Decades of Contemporary Photography. Our on-site exhibitions are closed for now, but I'm pleased to say that we are continuing to curate these important cultural experiences for our website. We are gradually reopening our spaces here at South Bank, and I very much look forward to when visitors can return to all of our beautiful spaces and participate in our inspiring programs. I'm also excited by how many Queenslanders have discovered our vast online offer. With so many of us housebound, State Library membership has soared with more and more people becoming aware of the benefits that it offers. Free movie streaming services and online courses are just a few of the perks available to State Library members. The 20 exhibition examines the vast diversity of this extraordinary state and what it means to be a Queenslander. Our curators have chosen 250 quintessentially Queensland photographs taken by more than 50 contemporary photographers. Moments of joy, heartbreak, love and hope pieced together to form an emotive story that reveals pivotal events that have shaped Queensland as we know it today. It is a story of a changing state, one that still has echoes of its past, but is also embracing a more diverse and tolerant future. 2020 has been such an extraordinary year, but as I look at the striking photos that make up this exhibition, I am reminded of the extraordinary period it follows. We have undergone seismic shifts, yet some things transcend time. The shock and devastation caused by natural disasters, the beauty of our statewide open spaces, the ongoing connection to people and place, it's all in this exhibition, Queensland moments captured through the lens an insight into our rich and complex history. Photos have been sourced from our vast photographic archive housed here at State Library. Many of the millions of photos in our collection are also available online. You can search a place, a personality, or a past time, and there's bound to be a treasure waiting to be found, and waiting for you to discover its story. Helping to guide us through the stories of this exhibition is a Queenslander who is no stranger to pivotal moments in our history. For nearly 50 years, this award-winning journalist has unpacked and examined the key moments that shape our lives. Kerry O'Brien needs little introduction. He has been a nightly fixture in many of our households as a compare and interviewer for the ABC. We are extremely fortunate to have him provide commentary on some of the exhibition highlights. So sit back, relax and enjoy, and I encourage you to share your own commentary using the hashtag SLQ20. Enjoy. Thanks, Vicky. Even though this exhibition is contemporary to this century, and I've looped south of the border for more than 40 years, it is also a walk down memory lane for me, as I suspect it will be for many other Queenslanders, no matter where you are. The exhibition is grouped into seven themes, ranging from evocative outback images to the passions of protest and politics and the traumas of natural disasters. But my reflections on those images have taken me on a less structured journey through Queensland history all the way back to my own childhood. The City Hall, with its clean-cut Italian Renaissance lines, is one of Brisbane's most enduring landmarks and has featured in the lives of millions of Queenslanders. It looks the same to me now as it did the day I stood there as a freckle-faced eight-year-old with tens of thousands of others, waving a small, limp Australian flag when the young Queen Elizabeth hit town the year after her coronation in 1953. It's impossible to exaggerate the impact of that long, long tour, including nine days in Queensland, the first to Australia by a reigning monarch. 
75% of the entire population saw her in the flesh. Still as a kid, I sang in choirs on what seemed like a vast city hall stage, recited such luminous poetry as Grasshopper Green at a Steadford's, with not quite the same impact as Mick Jagger and the Rolling Stones with their scandalous gyrations on the same stage in 1965. I returned to the city square in November 1975 with an ABC Four Corners crew, recording the raw emotion of the Brisbane crowd as Gough Whitlam delivered an indignant but fruitless call to arms in the election campaign following his dismissal from office. The picture of a semi-demolished Brisbane Festival Hall taken in 2003 immediately took me back 55 years to the Beatles' Brisbane concert the year before the Stones. I was 18 with my ginger Beatles-style mop top and winkle picker boots, and I can easily say I have never been to another concert like it. From the moment they hit the stage, the screams and squeals dominated everything with snatches of music occasionally sneaking through. We were all reduced to watching rather than hearing them perform, and afterwards I had some sense of how your ears must be affected if you're too close to an exploding bomb. In its lifetime, the stadium hosted practically all of the giants of the rock era, and no end of bloody prize fights. But speaking subjectively, of course, there was no milestone moment more memorable than the Beatles tour of 1964. About the same time the original Charlotte Street Stadium was built in 1910, the first lifesavers began patrolling at Greenmount Beach on the Gold Coast and gradually spread all the way to Southport. There's a picture in the exhibition from 2003 of quote unquote elderly lifesavers at Currawa Beach, pot bellies and all. It probably includes some who provided surveillance through the 50s to the mid 60s when I wore a path to the Gold Coast first with family and then with mates. We'll never know how many lives have been saved from the decades with their vigilance, and we'll also never know how many have been lost to melanoma. There was no slip, slop, slap in those days, and countless people used to line up at surface to be sprayed with mutton bird oil and bake for a couple of hours in search of a tan. It's also interesting to compare the contemporary Gold Coast skyline with my memories of the early 50s, when I first holidayed at Southport as a seven-year-old in one of a small scatter of holiday homes surrounded by what seemed like a desert load of sand dunes. In the 60s, the state government introduced Sunday trading to hotels, but you could only get a drink if you were a traveller, which meant masses of people driving at least 70 miles from home on Sundays just to be able to have a drink at the pub. So we would wear a track to surface, make the most of the two-hour beer garden sessions, with a two hour sunbake in between, jump in the car and drive home with all the other semi inebriated drivers, a practice that no doubt hastened the outlawing of drink driving and breath testing. It was official madness. I have a personal interest in a photo taken in 2000 of a seemingly nondescript dry stone wall at Bagara near Bundaberg that had been built by Pacific Islanders, probably well over a century earlier. It summons up one strand of the darker side of early Queensland colonial history, in which my own pioneering ancestors were among the beneficiaries in the Wide Bay District. Between 1863 and 1904, an estimated 62,000 islanders, men, women and children, were brought to Queensland from Melanesia in what were known as blackbirding ships, as indentured labour on sugar plantations from Meribra to Cairns. Many of them were either conned into signing up or were even forced onto ships at gunpoint. Predominantly, it was slavery by another name and an unknown number died of disease or malnutrition. My ancestor, John Eaton, whose father ironically had himself come to Australia in chains as a convict, had invested in the most notorious ship and ran his Meribra sugar plantation on Islander labour. There are quite a few country hotels featured in the exhibition, not surprising given how often they have functioned at the heart of so many towns in such a far-flung decentralised state. But the Blue Heeler Hotel at Kainuna in the far northwest between Winton and Cloncurry has a special place in Queensland and Australian history, mere kilometres from the billabong that inspired the legendary Banjo Patterson to write Waltzing Matilda. When I visited Kainuna with an ABC film crew in 1973, 
The town was not much more than the pub, a roadhouse, and I think from memory, a police station. Along with the grog, the pub housed the Kainuna Surf Club, complete with barbed wire surf reel propped up at one end of the bar. And small though it was, the pub was on the coach tour trail, and the publican told one story of an elderly American woman who had disappeared out the back to use the toilet. The bar was emptied by her blood-curdling scream, and they found her in a faint at the open door to the hotel freezer. She'd taken a wrong turn, and along with the hanging beef carcasses, she'd seen the frozen body of a local squatter, propped up in a corner, and reacted as you might expect. He had died on his property and was waiting to be collected for an autopsy. On the Kainuna trip, I also visited Burketown in the Gulf of Carpentaria, collecting more stories for the ABC's This Day Tonight. So I had a laugh when I saw this exhibition photo of a crocodile tethered out the front of the Burketown Hotel, which claims to be the most remote pub in Australia. The photo is one of a collection taken between 2008 and 2014 by photographic artist Hamish Cairns. I always enjoyed going bush, hunting stories, and we never came up empty, no matter how small or remote the community. The Burketown pub had its crocodile. There was another pub I once visited in Anarchy, another tiny watering hole on the highway west of Rockhampton, where locals were occasionally known to ride their horses into the bar. And another pub at Kalgoorlie in Western Australia that featured a beer-drinking camel out the back. He'd open his own cans, suck them dry, and spit the empties a considerable distance. Just up the road from Burketown, and just as remote from the rest of the state, is the indigenous community of Dumaji, where Hamish Cairns captured some great shots of the local rodeo. There's one of two pre-teen boys whose faces could be as old as time. So much history, old clashing with new, pre-colonial clashing with post-colonial at communities like Dumaji throughout Queensland. It's far too often a deeply troubled history a history I was reminded of again when I saw this photo of Cathy Freeman on the warm-up track at QE2 Stadium in Brisbane, the year after a huge triumph at the Sydney Olympics in 2000. I missed her gold medal 400 metres final, but was there for her semi-final win. It was a magic moment, but her glorious victory stretching out in that green and gold phantom suit to win the final so decisively, and then slumped to the track with every last ounce of energy drained from her was one of the most sublime moments in Australian sporting history, as was the collective sigh of relief from the nation that she had carried on her back. But Cathy Freeman has another story. I'll never forget her on the SBS program, Who Do You Think You Are? Breaking down on camera when she learned how her grandfather had been removed from his home in far north Queensland and transported to Palm Island for daring to question why he was paid significantly less than the white men with whom he worked side by side, doing exactly the same job. The seemingly endless stories like Cathy's own family history, now increasingly embedded in Queensland's and Australia's formerly documented history, are why Indigenous artists like Kev Carmody, featured in this exhibition at his powerful 2009 tribute concert in Brisbane, have struck such a chord across Australia. His lyrics are so evocative, they should tear at the nation's heart. I remember introducing Kev Carmody and Paul Kelly to the stage at the Sydney Town Hall at Gough Whitlam's memorial service in 2014 to sing the now famous Vincent Lingiari song, From Little Things Big Things Grow, with a small handful of exceptions, not a dry eye in the house. Freeman's photo was originally taken for Queensland's Centenary of Federation exhibition on reconciliation in 2001. She spoke of a sense of estrangement between non-Indigenous and Indigenous Australians ever since white settlement. Queensland's longest serving and most contentious Premier, Sir Joe Bielka peterson also participated and his idea of reconciliation was way different from Freeman's. One example he gave of reconciliation at work was that he employed local Indigenous people at his Kingaroy farm to help harvest his peanuts. He saw it as a virtue that his government collected and controlled the wages of most Indigenous people in Queensland, a form of official wage theft. 
the movement of many first Australians was also controlled by permit for decades in Queensland, and it has been documented that the abhorrent policy of apartheid in South Africa was modelled on Queensland's official treatment of its Indigenous people. Sir Joe, aged 90 when this photo was taken, observed for the exhibition that the stolen generation should have been called the saved generation. He'd passed on by 2018 when protesters marched through the streets of Brisbane in an Invasion Day rally, but no prizes for guessing what he would have had to say. The more that non-Indigenous Australians come to know the unfettered facts of their country's pre- and post-colonial history, the more likely they are to be sympathetic to the view for First Australians, the arrival of Captain Arthur Phillips' fleet of mostly convicts and soldiers did constitute an invasion. Of course, under the doctrine of terra nullius, ultimately thrown out by the High Court in the Eddie Mabo case, Australia had no inhabitants when the white settlers arrived. How fortuitous for them. In the Bielke Peterson era, that kind of rally would have more than likely been illegal. But throughout the state's history, Queenslanders have shown a willingness to take part in the streets in protest on a range of fronts, a tradition that has continued in this century. The huge protest against the looming Iraq war in February 2003, protesters crushing into the botanic gardens like sardines, accurately reflected national opinion and was a case in point. It mirrored similar activism around the country, but one month later, John Howard sent Australian troops into Iraq in support of an American-led invasion, in defiance of the United Nations. This rally reflected majority anti-war sentiment around the nation, but John Howard knew that as soon as he committed Australian troops to the conflict, public support would swing behind them, and so it did. The Iraq War has since been judged to be the greatest foreign policy disaster in US history and led to deep ongoing instability in the Middle East, fanning the flames of the terrorism it was supposed to defeat. There is still an Australian presence in Iraq today, as there is in Afghanistan, the other costly war of this century. At least Afghanistan was a valid war in the sense that it had United Nations sanction after Al-Qaeda's September 11 attack on New York's Twin Towers, masterminded by Osama bin Laden from his Afghanistan base. That invasion by another US-led coalition was launched in late 2001. But in 2009, when this picture was taken of an unidentified soldier at his Townsville barracks before being shipped out, Australian military personnel was still being dispatched to Afghanistan. It has been Australia's longest war involvement by far, and there is a broadly held view that whatever might have been achieved in the Afghanistan conflict in terms of the overthrow of the Taliban and the disruption to Al-Qaeda was seriously sabotaged by the morass in Iraq. At least one protest movement ended happily for the majority of Australians, including Queenslanders, but not before years of campaigning around the nation, including this rally in Brisbane in August 2011, to mark the seventh anniversary of John Howard's legislation passing the Parliament with Labor support to legally define marriage as the, quote, voluntarily entered into union of a man and a woman to exclusion of all others, close quote. The issue was extremely divisive and it wasn't until November 2017 that same-sex marriage campaigners won a resounding victory when 61% of Australians voted in favour of same-sex marriage against a no vote of 38% in a postal survey initiated by the Turnbull government. History was made just one month later when same-sex marriage was legalised by the Australian Parliament. Perhaps the most dramatic pattern to emerge from this photographic exhibition related to a protest that is beyond every human's capacity to control, in the short to medium term at least, and that is nature's own gathering protest against our collective failure to address climate change. Queensland has always had to cope with weather extremes, whether it's cyclones, floods, drought, or even bushfires. But there is now broad scientific acceptance that such events are just going to get more intense and more frequent. The story is in the pattern. And such is the random cruelty of these events,
that while much of Australia was still in the grip of the millennium drought, including significant parts of Queensland, in March 2006, Cyclone Larry tore its destructive path across the northeast coast at Innisfail, leaving punctured lives and $1.5 billion worth of shredded crops and eviscerated buildings in its wake. It was a double whammy for the state because the severity of the millennium drought was still hitting. Exactly four years later, it was Cyclone Alui which took just 30 hours to build in intensity from a tropical storm to a Category 5 cyclone, but it dropped again by the time it hit Airlie Beach, still making its present felt, still wreaking destruction. Just one year later, Cyclone Yazi hit near Mission Beach, the biggest in Queensland history, again uprooting homes and lives, this time with damage estimated at $3.5 billion. In between Larry and Alui, Queenslanders from the far north to the New South Wales border were hit from the dry deserts at the centre of the continent by what was later described as the mother of all dust storms. In September 2009, moving an estimated 16 million tonnes of dust, it hit Brisbane and the other coastal cities hard, but was also yet another blow to farmers out west still recovering from the millennium drought. And then, of course, there were the floods. In 2010-11, under the powerful influence of La Nina, heavy rains and record floods hit Brisbane and 90 other cities and towns in the southern half of the state. 33 people were confirmed dead and another three were never found. The direct damage was estimated at $1.5 billion, with a wider cost to the Australian economy of as much as $30 billion. The pictures from Brisbane particularly resonated with me because the house I grew up in, in the southern suburb of Tennyson, only a couple of hundred metres from the river, was completely covered by water in the 1974 flood and my parents only narrowly escaped. I know from their experience then what it must have been like for the thousands of Brisbane and Ipswich people whose homes were flooded in 2011. Our parents never returned to their home and so much of our family history in the letters and photographs of the pre-internet age was lost. The true measure of human cost for disasters like this is incalculable. While the people of southern Queensland were still reeling from the floods, North Queensland was hit by Cyclone Yazi, the biggest storm in the state's history. 10,000 people were driven from their homes. It crossed the coast at Mission Beach between Cairns and Townsville and wrought immense damage again to buildings and crops at an estimated cost again of $3.5 billion, which once again does not include the human impact. And the big rains came again early in 2019, this time a massive deluge across the Gulf of Carpentaria Plains with a flood front across more than 70 kilometres. 600,000 head of cattle were lost and countless native fauna. This photo of a dead Brahmin mother and calf on Gypsy Plains Station in the Channel Country of northwest Queensland epitomises the wider sense of loss. Of course, 2020 continues to be dominated by the coronavirus pandemic, only overshadowed in scale by the Spanish flu epidemic, which took more than 50 million lives almost exactly a century ago. These pictures of the Queensland lockdown reflect the story around the rest of the nation, as huge slabs of the economy were shut down. Supermarket shelves were emptied and governments moved to flatten the curve of people with the virus and head off a hospital gridlock, particularly in the intensive care facilities. Countless workers brought their jobs home and children were schooled from home. The overall experience has been without precedent in our lives. In the same way the federal government shut down borders from international visitors where all cases originated, Queensland moved to close its borders to all but essential travellers from New South Wales. So, as we head into the second half of 2020, the lockdown may be easing, but it is now confirmed that we are in recession, expected to be more savage than any since the Great Depression 90 years ago, and more history is being made around us as I speak. There is so much more to this exhibition than I've covered in this session. I would urge you to check it out for yourselves and see what memories they conjure up for you and where they take you.